West told me how he had obtained the specimen. It had been a vigorous man, a well-dressed stranger just off the train on his way to transact some business with the Bolton Warstead Mills. The walk through the town had been long, and by the time the traveller paused at our cottage to ask the way to the factories, his heart had become greatly overtaxed. He had refused a stimulant, and he had suddenly dropped dead only a moment later. The body, as might be expected, seemed to West a heaven-sent gift. In his brief conversation, the stranger had made it clear that he was unknown in Bolton, and a search of his pockets subsequently revealed him to be one Robert Leavitt of St. Louis, apparently without a family to make inquiries about his disappearance. If a man could be restored to life, no one would know of our experiment. We buried our materials in a deep strip of woods between the house and the potter's field. If, on the other hand, he could be restored, our fame would be brilliantly and perpetually established. So without delay, West had injected into the body's wrist the compound which would hold it fresh to use after my arrival. The matter of the presumably weak heart, which to my mind imperiled the success of our experiment, did not appear to trouble West extensively. He hoped at last to obtain what he had never obtained before, a rekindled spark of reason and perhaps a normal living creature. So, on the night of July 18th, 1910, Herbert West and I stood on the cellar laboratory and gazed at a white, silent figure beneath the dazzling arc light. As I stared fascinatedly into the sturdy frame which had lain two weeks without stiffening, I was moved to seek West's assurance that the thing was really dead. This assurance he gave me readily enough, reminding me that the reanimating solution was never used without careful tests as to life, since it could have no effect if any of the original vitality were present. As West proceeded to take preliminary steps, I was impressed by the vast intricacy of this new experiment, an intricacy so vast that he could trust no hand less delicate than his own. Forbidding me to touch the body, he first injected a drug in the wrist just beside the place his needle had punctured when injecting the embalming compound. This, he said, was to neutralize the compound and to release the system to a normal relaxation so that the reanimating solution might freely work when injected. Slightly later, when a change and a gentle tremor seemed to affect the dead limbs, West stuffed a pillow-like object violently over the twitching face, not withdrawing it until the corpse appeared quiet and ready for our first attempt at reanimation. The pale enthusiast now applied some last perfunctory tests for absolute lifelessness, withdrew, satisfied, and finally injected into the left arm an accurately measured amount of the vital elixir, prepared during the afternoon with great care that we had used since the college days, when our fears were new and groping. I cannot express the wild, breathless suspense with which we waited for the results on this first really fresh specimen. The first we could reasonably expect to open its lips in rational speech, perhaps to tell us of what it had seen beyond in the unfathomable abyss. West was a materialist, believing in no soul and attributing all the working consciousness to a bodily phenomena. Consequently, he looked for no revelation of hideous secrets from gulfs and caverns beyond death's barrier. I did not wholly disagree with him theoretically, yet held vague instinctive rem yet held vague instinctive remnants of primitive faith in my forefathers, so that I could not help eyeing the corpse with a certain amount of awe and terrible expectation. Besides, I could not extract from my memory that hideous, inhuman shriek we heard on the night we tried our first experiment in the deserted farmhouse at Arkham. Very little time had elapsed before I saw the attempt was not to be a total failure. A touch of color came to the cheeks hitherto, a chalk white that spread out under the curiously ample stuttle of his sandy beard. West, who had his hand on the pulse of the left wrist, suddenly nodded significantly, and almost simultaneously a mist appeared on the mirror and climbed above the body's mouth. There followed a few spasmodic muscular motions, and then and then an audible there followed a few spasmodic muscular motions, and then an audible breathing and visible motion of the chest. I looked at the closed eyelids, and thought I detected a quivering. Then the lights opened showing the eyes which were grey, calm, and alive, but still unintelligent and not even curious. In a moment of fantastic whim I whispered questions to the reddening ears, questions of other worlds which the, questions of other worlds of which the memory might still be present. Subsequent terror drove them from my mind, but I think the last one, which I repeated, was Where have you been? I do not know yet whether I was answered or not, for no sound came from the well shaped mouth. 
but I do know that at the moment I firmly thought the thin lips moved silent, forming syllables which I would have vocalized as only now if that phrase had possessed any sense of relevancy. At the moment, as I say, I was elated with the conviction that the one great goal had been attained, and that for the first time a reanimated corpse had uttered distinct words impelled by actual reason. In the next moment there was no doubt about the triumph, no doubt that the solution had truly accomplished, at least temporarily, its full mission of restoring rational and articulate life to the dead. But in that triumph there came to me the greatest of all horrors, not horror of the thing that spoke, but of the deed that I had witnessed, and the man with whom my professional fortunes were joined. For that very fresh body, at last writhing into full and terrifying consciousness with eyes dilated at the memory of the last scene on earth, threw out its frantic hands in the life of death struggle in the air, and suddenly collapsing into a second final dissolution from which there could be no return, screamed at the cry that will ring eternally in my aching brain, HELP! Keep off, you cursed little toe-headed fiend! Keep that damn needle away from me!